All right, so today we're diving into Shakespeare. Well, maybe not Shakespeare himself, actually. Oh! Yeah, you know, the Shakespeare authorship question. People have been debating for centuries whether that guy from Stratford-upon-Avon really wrote all those plays and poems. A question that never seems to get old, right? And you've got a really interesting take on it. Definitely. This YouTube video argues that some of those early works, like Venus and Adonis and Lucrece, those were published under Shakespeare's name, of course, but they might actually be written by, you ready for this? Christopher Marlowe. Marlowe. Now that's a theory you don't hear every day. Right. It's like straight out of a literary thriller, the idea that Marlowe could be the secret hand behind those famous lines. It's a bold claim. To really grasp it, we kind of have to rewind a bit. Look at the timeline. Christopher Marlowe, brilliant playwright in his own right, born the same year as Shakespeare, interestingly enough. But here's where it gets juicy, Marlowe. He supposedly died in 1593. And that's right when Shakespeare's career takes off. Exactly. Yeah. Just as Shakespeare starts publishing his works. Coincidence. It does make you wonder, doesn't it? Like, what are the odds? That's the question this video wants us to ask. They're suggesting it's not coincidence, it's a cover-up. Apparently, Marlowe was in some hot water back then, accused of heresy and atheism, big no-nos in those days. Yeah, not exactly the kind of accusations you want on your resume back then. Definitely not. So the theory goes, he stages his own death to avoid the whole mess. Wow. And then what? He just decides to become Shakespeare. Pretty much. Adopts the new name, keeps writing, but now it's all hush-hush, this big secret identity. The video even suggests some powerful figures like William Cecil might have helped Marlowe vanish. Mm. Like a shadowy Elizabethan spy thriller, right? Okay, now I have to know more. They can't just drop a bombshell like that without giving us some evidence. How do they support this whole Marlowe is Shakespeare thing? Well, they actually get into the nitty gritty of the literature, starting with Venus and Adonis. They focus on that dedication to Henry Ryleslie, the Earl of Southampton. The Earl. Fill us in for those of us who might not be quite up on our Elizabethan nobility. Who was this guy? <laughs> right, so the Earl, he was a big deal. Wealthy nobleman. A patron of the arts, basically. If you were a writer, you wanted this guy in your corner. High stakes, then. So what's so special about this dedication to the Earl? What's the big secret hidden in plain sight? Okay, so the author, he refers to the Earl as the first heir of my invention. Uh. Now, the video, they interpret this as Marlowe, disguised as Shakespeare, basically saying, hey, I'm passing on my legacy, but in a sneaky way. Yeah. You're the first heir to my work, even though everyone thinks it's by this Shakespeare fellow. Clever, but couldn't that phrase just be, you know, a bit of flattery? A way to butter up your wealthy patron? How can they be sure it's about a secret identity and not just being a good salesman? That's the million dollar question, right? It's all interpretation at this point. Yeah. But the video doesn't stop there. They point out that the opening lines of Venus and Adonis, they're lifted straight from Ovid, specifically from his amours. Mm. And... Guess who translated that particular piece of Ovid? Don't tell me. Marlowe. Bingo. Christopher Marlowe himself did that translation. So Shakespeare's big debut just happens to start with lines translated by the guy who's supposed to be dead but might actually be him in disguise. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. What else did they find? And it gets even wilder. Those lines from Ovid, they're all about immortality after death. The video suggests that Marlowe, under his new Shakespeare mask, could be sending a message a hint about his own supposed demise, like, hey, I'm still here, just in a different form now. A literary Easter egg, like he's dropping clues for anyone paying close enough attention. It's like that scene in a movie where they zoom in on a seemingly insignificant detail and you're like, wait, was that important? Um, like Marlowe's playing a game of literary hide and seek with us centuries later. I am so here for this literary detective work, but even though it's super intriguing, we have to ask, is this rock solid evidence or are we letting our imaginations run a bit wild here? That's the thing, isn't it? It's a fun theory, but correlation doesn't always equal causation. Just because there are these interesting connections doesn't automatically prove anything. Right, we can't get ahead of ourselves. But it does make you think twice about those historical coincidences. It makes you wonder what else might be hidden beneath the surface, right? And this video doesn't just stop with Venus and Adonis. They think Lucrece, Shakespeare's second narrative poem, that one might hold even more clues. Oh, <laughs> more clues about this whole Marlowe situation or just, you know, intriguing in general. I'll admit, I haven't spent as much time with Lucrece as some of the other works. Well, it's a powerful piece. 
based on that Roman legend of Lucretia, right? Tragic story. And this video suggests that it could be Marlowe's way of kind of working through his own situation, you know, mm. faking his death, living under this assumed name. I mean, I can see that. The story's about this woman driven to suicide after a horrific act of violence. That resonates with the idea of someone trapped by their own secrets, burdened by this double life. But how does the video connect Lucrece to Marlowe specifically? What's the link? So they focus on these themes of dishonor and shame. Those are really central to Lucrece, right? And the video, they argue that those emotions, they could reflect how Marlowe himself might have felt. Living a lie, having to deny his true identity. So the story within the poem becomes this reflection of Marlowe's inner turmoil. That's a pretty deep read. Yeah, and it gets even more complicated. See, later editions of Lucrece, they include this strange edition. There's like a ghost poem attached. It's called The Ghost of Lucrece. A ghost poem. Okay, now you have to explain that one. I have no idea what that even means. So back in the 17th century, some guy, he adds this poem to certain copies of Lucrece. He signs it TM. Now the video, they latch on to those initials. TM. Let me guess. Tarkin Marlowe. You got it. They're suggesting this TM could be our boy Marlowe inserting himself into the narrative again. Wait, wait, back up a second. Someone just added their own poem to Shakespeare's work, like a century later, and they sign it with initials that could be read as Tarquin Marlowe. Okay, now I see why you said it gets complicated. What did this ghost poem even say? Well, remember how we were talking about those themes of hidden identity, deception, all that mm. being at the heart of Lucrece? This ghost poem it kind of doubles down on those ideas, like it's commenting on the original. Meta. Give us an example. How did this TM guy weave his own stuff into Shakespeare's work? They highlight one line in particular that's, well, it's pretty loaded. It goes, look under the base type of Tarkin's name, I cipher figures of iniquity. He writes himself the shamer, I the shame, the actor, he and I the tragedy. The stage, my and he the history, the subjects, I and he the ravisher. He, murdering me, made me my murderer. Whoa. Okay, that's a lot to unpack. But it does sound like whoever wrote that, they're drawing a parallel between themselves and Tarquin. And Tarquin, he's the villain, right? The embodiment of betrayal, of lust in the original Lucrece poem. Exactly. And remember, Tarquin, he's the catalyst for the whole tragedy. He sets everything in motion with his actions. So this video, they interpret that line as a confession of sorts. Like TM, maybe Marlowe, is saying, hey, look closer. The real story here, the real tragedy, it's mine. Don't be fooled by the name on the cover. It's like a message in a bottle stuffed inside another message, hiding clues within a poem that's already published under a fake name. This whole thing's like a literary escape room. But even if we entertain this idea for a minute, we can't ignore the obvious counterargument. This video does a good job of laying out their case, but it kind of skips over all the traditional arguments for Shakespeare actually being, well, Shakespeare. Right, we have to be careful. Can't get too caught up in the excitement of the mystery and forget to look at all sides of the story. Exactly. Balance is key. So just for argument's sake, let's switch gears. What evidence is there that contradicts this whole Marlowe as Shakespeare thing? Feels like we're putting together one of those puzzles where half the pieces are missing and you're never quite sure if you're forcing it to make sense, you know? Totally. And that's where the traditional side of this debate comes in. They remind us that even though we don't have every single detail of Shakespeare's life perfectly documented... We do have something to work with. Exactly. And what we do have, it puts him right there in the thick of the theater scene, connected to those works that bear his name. So spill the tea. What kind of evidence supports the whole Shakespeare Shakespeare thing? Well, we've got records of him working as an actor, as a playwright in London. Mm -hmm. His name's on official documents, mm -hmm. stuff about theater companies, even financial records, property purchases, lawsuits, you name it. So like a paper trail. It's not like he was a ghost in every aspect of life except for writing these plays. Exactly. There's a real person there. And that does make it harder to believe that some completely unknown guy was actually behind those masterpieces, right? I mean, it would be quite the conspiracy. It would. And to be fair, this video we've been discussing, they do acknowledge that there's evidence on the other side, but they encourage us to question those narratives. To think, what if those records were talking about? What if they were manipulated somehow? Or what if someone was purposely planting those breadcrumbs, leading everyone to Shakespeare or Stratford? It's definitely a more exciting story, mm, right? Yeah. A, a lot more intriguing than just, oh, a talented writer wrote some plays and became famous. Way more exciting. But it highlights something important about history itself. It's not about being 100% certain all the time. Yeah, it's messy. Exactly. We're stuck interpreting the evidence we have. 
even when it's incomplete, even when it contradicts itself. It's like what you were saying before about how there are always stories hidden beneath the surface. We might never know for sure if there's any truth to this whole Marlowe as Shakespeare idea, but wow, it's a wild ride. It is. And even without a neat little answer, it makes us look at things differently, yeah. right? Like, what if we've missed something? What assumptions have we been making without even realizing it? That's what's so cool about deep dives like this. They make you question everything you thought you knew. And this one, it reminds us that history isn't set in stone. It's an ongoing conversation. Exactly. We're constantly discovering new things, reinterpreting old things. And sometimes even a theory that sounds a little out there can make us understand the past in a whole new way. Couldn't have said it better myself. And hey, who knows, maybe one day we'll stumble across some new piece of evidence that flips the whole Shakespeare story on its head. That would be quite the plot twist, a real Shakespearean drama in itself. But for now, we're left with these tantalizing questions. Did Marlowe really pull off the ultimate disappearing act and live on as Shakespeare? Were those clues in Venus and Adonis and Lucrece deliberate? We might never know for sure, but it sure makes you look at those works, at the whole Elizabethan literary scene in a whole new light, doesn't it? Definitely does. A good mystery always leaves you wanting more. So what do you think, dear listener? What's the most compelling part of this whole thing? Does the evidence for Marlowe as Shakespeare intrigue you? Do you side with the traditional view? Maybe you have a completely different theory altogether. Let us know. Whatever you conclude, we hope this deep dive has piqued your curiosity and maybe even inspired you to question everything you thought you knew. Isn't that what great art and great mysteries are supposed to do? 